Good evening and welcome to tonight's event, Mermaid Stories and Sex with the author Sheila Hedy. Thank you for joining us tonight from wherever you have found a comfortable place to listen to our talk about Sheila's writing and her career as a writer and now she's also teaching because we're able to speak with Sheila Hetty tonight because she's a 29th Picoder guest professor for literature at the University of Leipzig. The Picoder guest professorship for literature brings leading English language writers to Leipzig University's American Studies program to teach in the fields of creative writing and literary studies. The project is based on a partnership between Holzbrink Berlin the German Academic Exchange Service and the University of Leipzig. Next to their teaching at American Studies Leipzig, Picoder guest professors share their work and expertise with the broader public in readings and other forums that address the potentials of lit literature for our contemporary society. Sheila Hetty is the author of 10 books of fiction and nonfiction, including the novels Motherhood, How Should a Person Be, and the story collection The Middle Stories. Her new novel, Pure Color, will be published in February 2022. Her new children's book, A Garden of Creatures, will also be published next year. Sheila was named one of the new Vanguard by the New York Times, a list of 15 women writers from around the world who are shaping the way we read and write fiction in the 21st century. Her books have been translated into 23 languages. I'm Teresa Bücker, journalist and author from Berlin. And I'm really looking forward to this conversation with Sheila Hetty. She will also be reading from her story collection, Middle Stories, and How Should a Person Be. Both books uh, and also Motherhood are available in German language. If you have any questions for Sheila, you can ask them in the chat on Twitter, Facebook, and YouTube, and we will choose some of your questions later on. I hope you enjoy our talk, and don't be shy, just ask. Hi. Hi. Hi, Sheila. How are you? Good. How are you? Good. Are you in Toronto right now? Um, I'm about two hours outside Toronto. We have a place here in the country. So, um, yeah, it's yeah. summer. It's summer already here. Would you like to visit Leipzig for your professorship? Yeah, I, I've actually wanted to go and visit Leipzig for many years now. There was that art movement in the 90s, those painters that I was a huge fan of, and I just thought that Leipzig seemed like a great city. But I'm not sure if I would have been able to do the professorship if I had to go to Leipzig at this point. Um, so this has kind of worked out perfectly. Mm -hmm. And the classes already started, right? Yeah, we're about four weeks in. So it's two classes. It's the literature class, sex and American literature, and then a creative writing class mm -hmm. um, with about 25 students in each. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I recently read an interview with an author who said, it's so strange being interviewed about my own book. I wrote everything I wanted to say into that book. Yeah, so how important is talking about your writing for you? Um, I mean, I love having conversations about art and literature. It doesn't have to be about my work. It can be about anybody's work. Um, you know, you put out a book and you hope that it, sparks conversations you want it sort of to i always think about books as kind of like another person in the world um you know it like creates a dialogue hopefully not just with the reader but with the reader and other people so i'm happy to ha participate in conversations around the book i mean i don't really always feel like i can add anything like that writer says you know whatever whatever had to go in the book is in the book um but I think it's always interesting sometimes for people to hear how things are written to the extent that you can ever really remember. It always becomes kind of foggy. Is a book finished for you once it's published? Yeah, it really is. I mean, this book that I've just been working on now, Pure Color, that you mentioned, I just got um, the copy edits back from the copy editor this week. And I was just this morning reading them over, you know, to see whether to agree or to disagree with some of the changes she'd made. And the book just feels so far away from me right now. Um, I would hate to touch it, you know, in any dramatic way because it just feels really done and over. And it's like a, a skin that I've shed that has nothing to do with me anymore. So yeah, they do feel done when by the time they're published. Mm -hmm. 
Um, did you work on it for several years, uh, years like on motherhood? I think I read you worked on motherhood for seven years. Yeah, this one was less maybe, I think I started it early 2018 and uh, just finished it this, you know, a couple of months in, in February. Yeah. And uh, is your children's book already done? That's done too. They both kind of came, I both wrote them sort of at the same time. Mm -hmm. um, and then a friend of mine illustrated it, Esme Shapiro. She's the illustrator on it. And it's so, I mean, I, I've only ever written one children's book before, but with this one, it's interesting because you get the illustrations back um, and then you see the words beside the illustrations. And I'm that's something I'm so not used to. And so I edited the words to make them plainer because I felt like the pictures were doing so much work that the image that maybe the words needed to do less work. And then I got, a, I got the proofs back, which had the words and the pictures together. And then the, the words seemed too plain, like I had overdone it. So I had to go back to the earlier version of the words, which it was before I saw the pictures before I had changed it. It's, you don't really know what you're dealing with until you see it before you on the page. You know, when you see the words and the pictures together, it's just, anyway, I mean, I don't know. I'm, I feel like the, I feel like it would be ideal if you're really doing a children's book to sort of conceive the images and, and the words at the same time, probably, if you're somebody who can both illustrate and write. Um, yeah, I feel less certain what I'm doing with the children's book than with the novels. How did you two work together, you and the illustrator? Well, I just wrote the story and then I sent it to her. I didn't really know her very well. I'd met her once before, but she lives in Toronto and New York. And um, she I'd actually commissioned a painting from her before. You can sort of see it behind me. It's, <laughs> it's the dog. So I we have the same publisher and, and she was doing pictures of people's pets for a while. So I, uh, our dog had died. So I got her to draw the, do this painting for us. And then when I wrote the story, I thought, I didn't know if it was really good or not. And I thought, well, I'll send it to Esme and see if she thinks it should be a children's book. Cause I love her children's books and she loved it. And she said she wanted to illustrate it. And so, and so, yeah. So then I just got back the images from her and I had no idea what it was going to look like, how she was going to interpret it. But, I like the images better than the text. <laughs> Are you looking forward to doing promo for those two books in person? Um, I don't want to do as much in person as as I've done in the past. Mm -hmm. um, that world just seems to me like I'm not really ready to get back into all that again. You know, I traveled so much before and having had this last year just in one place, I, I, I love it. You know, when you travel a lot, especially when you're in a relationship, like every time you go away and every time you get back, you're sort of like resettling with each other and there's all this upheaval and you miss your dog. And I mean, it's just, yeah. So I really have enjoyed the consistency of this past year. So I don't, I don't think I want to do this much. Did anything change for you in the past year? Um, um, probably a lot. Um, I, I don't know. It's really hard to say so close up. It's funny and everyone, wanted to talk about that pandemic all year. Mm -hmm. And now I feel like, at least in some places, now that the vaccine is sort of rolling out in some parts of the world, no one, everyone wants to kind of just start to forget it. Um, I don't know what's changed. Every Like I have so many friends who got divorced. <laughs> I guess that's the biggest <laughs> thing that's changed. <laughs> yeah, it was just this rash of divorces. Yeah. So you're not going to do as much interviews for your t new books or are you going to do them digitally? I don't know. I, they haven't started talking to me about that yet. I always kind of have this fantasy that I, I'll, I'll not do any, but that I never seem to, that's never seems to be the reality. And then you kind of become excited about it. Like you, you know, and then it's nice to meet people who it's nice to, I, I like having conversations with journalists and, and artists and so on. Did you do anything special to get to know your students in Leipzig um, via Zoom? That's, you know, I probably should have. <laughs> I mean, um, nothing beyond the teaching. I think, you know, the, when we had the first classes, I was very depressed right afterwards. I thought this is not going to work, you know, because I felt so far away from them. But I feel like every week we're getting closer and closer. 
um, you know, as I read their writing and as we talk more in class, I think it's a little awkward for everybody, but every week I'm happier and happier. And actually I, I feel pretty happy with the work that we're doing, especially in the literature course. I've never taught a literature course before. So for me, it's almost like I'm back in school, you know, like having to read these books every week and, and having to really, you know, normally I read books and I just read them, but having to analyze them and think about them and think about how to talk to the, uh, talk about them. I feel like I'm getting a deeper understanding of each of these books. I, you know, I kind of have this wish like I could teach more because you read better when you're teaching something than if you're just reading it. Yeah. yeah. So as uh, the title for tonight's reading is Mermaids, Stories and Sex, uh, I su uh, suggest we jump right in and you read one of your stories. So yeah. you get an impression of your writing. Sure. So this is um, the reason I picked this. This is from my first book, The Middle Stories. I wrote this um, collection of short stories when I was in university. So um, the age of some of the students that I'm teaching. So I thought it would be nice to read or read a piece from that time, my early 20s. Okay. Mermaid in a Jar. I have a mermaid in a jar that Quilty bought me at a garage sale for 25 cents. The mermaid's all, I hate you, I hate you, I hate you. But she's in a jar, and unless I loosen the top, she's not coming out to kill me. I keep the little jar on my windowsill, right behind my bed, right near my head. So if I look up in the middle of the night, up and back, I can see her swimming in the murky little pool of her own shit and vomit, and I can smile. Hello, mermaid. How are you this fine evening? I can say, and sometimes do. How very sad it is that you're so beautiful, and you're so young, and you're so fucking trapped you'll never get out of that bottle. Ha ha. Once I went on a class trip and brought my mermaid along, just for the hell of it. We were going to Niagara Falls and I was thinking, right, well, maybe I'll hold her over the rail, give her a little scare, put her in her place, or about letting her loose down the falls and out of my life. But once we got there, I forgot her in my little brown lunch bag with my hot cheese sandwich under my seat in the yellow school bus. But she got jolted on the ride there and jolted on the ride back, and that was enough for me. Once I had a party and invited all my friends, seven little girls, to play and sleep over. And having called every number flashing in our heads and having already called for pizzas twice and seanced out of our minds, I just thought, oh, why don't I bring my mermaid out to show? They can make their faces at it. They could have their fun. And we'd be able to talk, toss it back and forth like a real little football. But then Emma fell asleep. And then so did Wendy and Carla and the rest. And the mermaid just stayed locked in the closet where I'd put her that afternoon. Once when I thought she needed a bit of discipline, I rolled her measly bottle down Killer Hill in the ravine. Another time I threw her deep into my best friend's pool. Now she's getting old, it seems. I even saw a gray hair on Friday and wrinkles are spreading all across her skin. And as much as I liked her before, I like her even less now. I was thinking sort of what to do with her, but I think I'll just keep her there a little while longer, at least until I'm happy again. What is what is it like to to read a story that you wrote two decades ago? Yeah, it's really strange. Well, I pick up on different things. The line now she's getting old. It seems I even saw gray hair on Friday and wrinkles are sp spreading across her skin. That was a point that I zeroed in on. Um, I don't know. It just reminds me of uh, that time in my life where I was pretty unhappy and um, lonely and still kind of. Um, very detached from other people in the world. I felt very, yeah, all, I think all the stories in that book are are kind of bleak. Um, it's, I don't feel like that same person, life doesn't feel the same way to me anymore. Um, but I love writing because it gives you sort of the truest document of who you were at a certain time in your life, truer than any photograph or any diary, you know, because it's, it's just really what was how you felt inside in a way that only fiction can, I think, can really capture. So it makes me feel sad, really, to read those stories, actually. I mean, yeah. I mean, they're funny, too, um, but they make me feel sort of sad. Um, you don't publish a book every year. So do you keep track of other writings, uh, other other texts you don't publish to to look back at what you felt like at the time? Um, no, but I feel like every five years, more or less, I publish a book. So I think that um, 
books capture a period of my life, like, and a period lasts usually a few years, not just one year. So um, I don't know, like before I was publishing books, I always thought of my life in terms of which boyfriend I was with. I'd be like, oh, those are the years I was with that boyfriend. And those are the years I was with that boyfriend. And now I just think, oh, those are the years I was writing that book. Those are the years I was writing that book, which I'm sure my boyfriend is, my current boyfriend's happy about that. I, <laughs> I don't need that way of tracking time anymore. <laughs> Did you have a specific audience in mind when you wrote Middle Stories? No, I was really just, I feel like writing myself out of my childhood. Um, like the stories in the book, similar to the, the Mermaid in the Jar, are sort of fable-like and a little bit like children's stories, a little bit, um, yeah, they have like frogs in them and princesses. Not only, like some of them don't have any of that, they're just very realistic, but I, I feel like the, uh, what I, I wasn't writing them for anybody. I, I was learning, I was writing them so I could teach myself how to write. So the, the way I wrote those stories was, um, I wrote very, very quickly at that time. Um, and I wrote hundreds and hundreds of stories and I didn't know how to edit because um, the thing about editing, when you're editing, you're editing towards something, um, you know, and I didn't have anything that I would, I didn't have a towards, I didn't know what anything should become. So the only thing I could do instead of editing was just write as many stories as possible and hope that some worked the way they came out. Um, and I was, uh, and so, yeah, so, so I have 30 stories in that book and um, yeah, I was just trying to find my own voice and, and find, find my own sentences. And I feel like by writing so much um, that sort of slowly developed Um And it's sort of, you know, the stories have something sort of similar to each other in a lot of ways. And I feel like, you know, when I was writing those stories, I I felt frustrated with myself that the stories weren't more different from each other. Um, and I kept trying to make them more different from each other. And I remember thinking at some point, like, you have to stop doing that. Like, don't worry about trying to make them different from each other. Just write what wants to, what, what you want to write, you know? And as soon as I let myself, I guess, imitate myself or copy myself or, or go down the same paths in my brain over and over again, then I started to develop the style that turned into my way of writing. And the other thing that I really tried to train myself when I was writing those stories was to really follow my impulses very, you know, to the sentence. So if I was in a room, say with two characters, and I didn't know what could happen next in the room, I would just leave the room. So I, I tried not to draw out any scenes that didn't want to be drawn out. And in terms of ending the stories, I also just like let myself end the stories when the sentences stopped coming. So, you know, I'd write, I'd write, I'd write, and then like, I wouldn't know what to write next. And I would just be like, well, I guess that's the end of the story. So it was really like training myself to, to trust my impulses at that time in my early 20s when I was starting, yeah. In Leipzig, you're now teaching a class on creative writing. So, mm -hmm. can you can you actually teach writing to other people? Because every author has to find his or her own style of writing and mm -hmm. keep learning, keep developing. So, so what is it is it that you teach your students? Well, I I've never done this before teaching creative writing over so many weeks. After the second class, I kind of realized, you know, what I was going to do is sort of have exercises and like writing, you know, we would write in class together. And then I sort of realized like everyone should just have their own project that they work on for the semester and they can sort of check in with other students every week. But yeah, like, like you're saying, I mean, um, I think what I can give the students in the creative writing class is like the freedom to take that time to just do what they really want to do. Um, I think there's sometimes a feeling when you're young and you want to write that it's not important to do that. And that, you know, you give your time to your friends or your parents or um, things that seem important, but sort of writing can be at the bottom of the list, even if you have a real longing to do it. And so I feel like just saying like, you can use this time to do whatever you want in your writing is, a, is, an, is maybe enough of a start. Um, but I don't know, I'm sort of learning as I go, like, 
every week I'm every week before the day before the class, I'm trying to think like, where, where do I think they are this week? You know, what would I want at that, at their age, at that stage in the project? Mm -hmm. I don't know if it's going to work or not this class, but I'm hoping that, that it does. You can't really teach someone to write. I do a lot of mentoring one-on-one -on -one with people and that's, that's easier because I can read what they're writing and just say like, there's something, there's something going on here that seems wrong and I can help, help them talk it through. You know, often people will write because they think this is what writing looks like and they try to make their writing resemble what they think writing should look like. And what I try to do is be like, no, you, you can invent what writing is for yourself. But with 20 people, I've got to figure out how to do that for everybody at once. <laughs> Um, in the description of the class, it says not everyone has to share every time, but students who think they'll never want to share should consider not taking this class. So can can you tell us what sharing your writing felt like when you had just started and what it feels like now to, to show early drafts to friends or other authors? Yeah, I mean, I haven't changed much in that regard. I've always been very excited to share my writing with people. I've always wanted to. Um, I've always had friends that I've shared my stuff with. I just, I get overexcited and even still, like I'll write something and I'll send it to a few friends. Um, I think for me, it is a way of um, being in the world is writing but also giving that writing to people um i can't i can't imagine writing without that next step um it's it's not because i'm writing it for anybody else but because it would just be too claustrophobic not to share it like it's just like this echo chamber of you writing and it's you reading it and there's no air if it doesn't get out you know it's I, I, I vis viscerally like the feeling of sending my stories out to my friends. So, so you must have friends who have uh, have a lot of time. And do you, is it a relationship that developed over time that they know you're going to send them something? Yeah. It's it's mutual. You know, I I read my friends stuff. They read my stuff. Um, I I have. You know, I don't. I don't think I'm overburdening anyone. It's not like I write 700 page books and then I ask them to read it by next week. You know, I, I don't think it's a big um, imposition. I, I try not to overdo it. Um, but a lot of the people that I share with are people that are also artists so they can um, arrange their time in such a way that they can read a story now and then. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it, it sounds a bit like it's, also a community project and not only you writing by yourself but you 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 conceive your writing and your art as, as something that that should be shared and should be something that is developed with other people along yeah i mean it's part of friendship for me like part of friendship for me is making art and it has been since i was a little kid like my friends and i used to put on plays like it's always i've always understood friendship and and creation as sort of the same activity in some sense, um, you know, like if you marry somebody and have children, like you make a family, like love involves making often. And I think for me, friendships also involve making, you know, you're not making children or a family or a house, but you're making um, art, art um, and not just your individual work, but sort of, I care not just about my books, but that the book, that other books are good too, you know? So I don't only, it's not only important to me to work on my books. I want to work on my friends' books. Like I want them to work on my book. I just got a, uh, some possible covers for Pure Color. And, you know, I sent them to like 10 friends. Just, I, I, I kind of feel like my brain doesn't, know everything that it you know but i i know who knows so i can send it to this person and this person and this person and be like how do you see it how do you see it how do you see it and then from that i can know how i see it i kind of feel like i never want to just see through my eyes um or it's like uh it sharpens what you see to see what other people see at the same time 
Is that advice that you would give to younger artists to start building a community like that? No, it's not really advice I give because I just think not everybody's that way. I mean, some people need to do it differently. Like some people need to be all alone. It's just, I, I think that everybody has to find their own way. I would never say this is the way, this is my way, you know? Um, but you have to do what suits your personality. So like I'm, this just suits my personality. I love having conversations. I love making things. I love friendships that are, that are not, um, that, that, I like friendships that have like a, a goal to them, you know, that have a purpose to them beyond just the pleasure of being with somebody. I like working. So I like when my friendships involve work. But somebody else might be really different. <laughs> the art world has suffered in the pandemic and some artists would say there should be a lot more financial support for artists. And but also a debate about why art is important because uh, it wasn't really addressed in the pandemic. And so would you say art is essential for us as a society? Yeah, it seems to be. I mean, there's just no human culture without art making. It seems to be a drive the same way sex is a drive. Creation is a drive, you know? Um, I found, you know, in the early months, the first half, let's say, of the pandemic, um, I felt that there was no place for people to gather and talk about art. You know, they're just, I did feel like, oh, you wouldn't want to put something out in the world now, not because individuals don't need it, but because there's no convert, because it can't create a culture of conversation around it. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that that's one of the things that art does is creates a, uh, a conversation around it. And the conversation is about the work, but also about culture and humans and society and everything that the work is about. And because people weren't gathering, I felt like the any art that was coming out didn't, get that swirl of conversation about it really like no one was gathering in bars to talk about this book or that movie or that play it just seemed very depressing it seemed i couldn't find it in myself to create anything because i felt oh it, there's no place for it to go mm -hmm. I and mean, i was reading a lot i was reading a lot of books but uh, i didn't feel the urge to make something new mm -hmm. do you see that coming back um gatherings and talking about art or has something been lost in the past year? Oh, it'll come back. It'll come back. <laughs> I mean, we're still in lockdown, so it hasn't come back here yet. <laughs> yeah, what, what is it like in Canada, by the way? Um, so what they're doing is they want everyone to get their first shot before they give everyone their second shot. So um, I got my shot. And so everyone who got their shot is basically waiting till the fall to get their second one. That's their strategy. Um, but Toronto is still locked down. You can't go into shops. I mean, no one's been able to go into a restaurant for the last year. I, I think we're in lock, you know, you're not supposed to see people outside your household. I mean, it's still pretty, we're still in the thick of it. It feels like, I mean, the numbers are going down, but, um, we just had a, a third wave in, in, in Ontario and yeah. So what's the first thing you want to do when it's possible again? I've got this friend, Julia, and we uh, we like walking to Little India, like it's across this, the from where we live. It's like an hour walk and we go to a restaurant there and I just, for some reason, that's like a specific thing that I miss, like walking across the city and going to a restaurant with her and spending hours just talking. Yeah, I want to do that. When you finish the book, um, do you go on a break or do you start other projects right away? Um. I have this project that I always come back to uh, that I sort of work on between things. Like, it's like, I showed this to my creative writing class. It's sort of like, I took 10 years of diaries and I put them in, alpha, in alphabetical order by sentence. And that's something that it, I've been working on it now for like seven or eight years. And every time I don't know what to work on, I just sort of work on that because I can sort of work on it endlessly. Um, so I have these projects that can sort of fill in the space between novels, but I don't have any idea what my next novel will be like. Um, I have this feeling like there's, I always have this feeling there's, there can never be another one. You know, I'm just done. But I guess because you feel like you sort of emptied yourself into this one, 
and you have nothing more. And it's hard to imagine life filling you up again or giving you anything new. Um, you never know what the next thing you're going to be interested in is or what your next major problem is going to be or what, you know. So it's kind of like trying to look into the future. You can't. You just kind of think like, I guess the future is just going to be exactly like today. It's really hard to imagine things ever being different. It's hard for me to imagine the next book always. It takes usually about a year for me to sort of start finding my way to something new. Can you already tell us what the new book is going to be about? The next one? Pure uh, Color or the one after that? Oh, yeah, Pure Color. Mm, yeah, I mean, it's sort of about death and and being in the middle of one's life. And um, this is the premise is that, you know, God's an artist who created this universe, but he's not a very good artist and he doesn't like what he made. And so is, you know, we're in the first draft and then everything's going to be destroyed and there's going to be a second draft. And so it's sort of about like living at the end of the first draft, um, knowing that we're like the imperfect creatures in the imperfect world. But, it, you know, it's also sort of about death, but not the sadness of death, more the like psychedelic beauty of it. Um, my father died a couple of years ago. And so I had already started writing this book, but then his death interrupted it and made it something different. And, and my experience, um, I just, like everything in life, when I come to it, when I encounter it for myself, it always feels different from the representation I've received of it. And so the representation of what it was like to be grieving that I had received was nothing like what I had actually experienced. Um, you know, I felt, I felt like it was like being in a brand new world. Um, it wasn't like being in this world and being extremely sad. It was just like, oh, the world is completely different suddenly. And in a way that was not only tragic, but also kind of amazing, like being born, you know, like, you're like oh, so when somebody dies, you're born into a new world. So I kind of like wanted all to capture all that. But it's also about like middle age and 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 what do you do here? What do you do in the middle of life? You know, it's about a lot of different things. And when you reflect on those things, um, do you usually want to write about it, or is it sometimes do you have stuff that you say no, it's that is not for a book, that is not for writing? I mean, I didn't want to write about all that. I just thought I better. It was more like I should write this stuff down because I'll forget. Um, and I didn't think it was going to be for a book. I just thought it was for myself. I'm like, just you want to, you just write it down because you're not going to remember in a month. It'll, it'll all have changed. So I just sort of, and I feel like a lot of my books come out of that impulse to just like remember for myself. I have such a bad memory. I have like the worst memory of anyone I know. And so I think part of wanting to write is wanting to just not lose all of life as I pass through it. Um, and then when it comes to compose a book, I have material, you know, because I've, I've written for that reason. I, I have, I've very rarely, most of what I've published is stuff that I didn't think I was going to publish. I think that if I wrote with the thought, this is going to be published and this is for a book, I wouldn't be able to write the way that I want to write. I have to always sort of trick myself into thinking that this is not for publication. It's just for my own documentation. I still seem to be able to play that trick on myself. I don't know how long that's going to last, but it seems to still be a trick. No, but, to play. No, I find that really interesting because that um, it comes back to my, my earlier question about having an audience in mind, because that's, I've been told that a lot of times that as a, as a writer, you should have an audience in mind. And um, I, I was thinking or well, asking myself if, if that can be limiting if you're writing for a specific audience. With Motherhood, my last book, I felt like when I was editing it, you know, I spent about two years editing it. Um, I had an audience in mind, but it's always an audience of people I know. So I had like, 
10 friends, mostly women, who I felt like I want them to read this book. And, you know, a number of them was because I had a dispute with them. Like I have a writer friend who um, named Sarah Manguso and she's a poet and she published a piece in Harper's Magazine about becoming a mother. And she became a mother, I guess, in her late thirties. So she had this whole life beforehand and she was able to say, okay, now this is, now my life is different because I'm a mother. And I really didn't like her piece. I just felt like it offended me. It was, it really hurt me and upset me. Um, and so she's one of the people that I was writing my book for. So when I think of an audience, I think of it like very specific, like Sarah is the audience for this book. Like I have a beef with her. <laughs> um, I have an argument and this book is my entry into that argument. You know, and with how should a person be, you know, obviously Margot, my best friend, Margot Williamson, who's the character in the book, she was the audience for the book. And, you know, but but in terms of an audience that you don't know beyond you, that's I think that's a different thing than an audience, you know. Mm -hmm. Your book Motherhood has a narrator. It's it's not you writing. Um, um, and sometimes sometimes uh, people don't get it, you probably get a lot of questions like that, but I'm interested in what, what type of freedom does it give you to, to discuss a topic like that through a narrator's voice? Or what does it add to a conversation when, when you combine personal experience, but also a third person? Um, it's just the, like the element of the imagination you know, and I'm just able to invent scenes, um, invent chronologies, uh, invent a narrative. Um, you know, a lot of, I mean, I've never written, apart from essays here and there, I've never written a book about myself or, you know, I mean, it, I just don't even think that I would have the interest. Um, I do have a sense when I'm writing a book of like creating something apart from me. Um, it's like a sculpture or something, you know? And so I feel like the pleasure comes in crafting it and making all sorts of decisions that are narrative decisions and, and structuring decisions and linguistic decisions. And it's not, It's not about confessing or telling anybody anything about myself. So if I saw it as myself, if I saw the narrator as myself, or the story as having to be about me, I just think it would just be boring. It would just be, there'd be nowhere to go. There'd be no work for me to do in my head. Um, you know, like when you're writing a book and you're editing, you're trying to make something beautiful and that has meanings that you don't intend, that the repetition of editing will bring meaning, will, will draw meaning into it. The more years you work on it, the, the, the more layers of meaning it will get just by the repetition of going over the same pages. If you're writing about yourself, I don't think that that, that depth and layer of meaning that you're not even conscious of, I don't think that comes. So, Do you think, uh, like, when, when you talk about motherhood, did you get to that point where people understood it's not you writing this, but you created a narrator? I mean, some people do and some don't. And I think that's okay because I wasn't... What I know and want is different from what I want the reader to think. I don't think it's bad if the reader thinks this is... Sheila Hetty. Um, I don't think that harms the book. It's probably good for the book. I sort of want it to feel like that. Um, I want that. I want the reader to take that person as real. Um, yeah. Thank you. Um. So you're now teaching a class about sex in American literature. Was it your idea to do that? It was my boyfriend's idea. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> I was thinking like losers, you know, <laughs> losers in American fiction. He was like, you, why don't you, why don't you 
teach sex in American literature because you've taught, you've written about, you've written well about sex. And he's like, and that's something people will want to take. Mm -hmm. He said, it'll be a very popular class. And I was like, um, and then I realized that there's, that all, many of my favorite books really are written by people who write sex well, you know, mm -hmm. and, and, and then it seemed like it made sense as a topic. Those people that, that write sex well, like Henry Miller, for example, um, who was like a, one of my biggest influences as a writer when I was young, they, there's a kind of freedom to being able, there's a kind of freedom in the artist that can write sex well, you know, there's, there's an openness to all aspects of life and an, and a acknowledgement that sex is another aspect of life, you know, and that you want to portray it with the same complexity and the same honesty as everything else. And there's like, I think a kind of exuberance, like a vitality and an exuberance in a lot of the sex writing that I love. Um, and also a lot of pain. Um, it can reveal so much. Uh, writers who do it, who write about sex well, there's, it's like that those scenes have, have, they're like compacted with meaning and feeling and in a way that not other, that other scenes might not be. So, to end, and, I, and then I ended up, because I had to do the, I was reading a lot to see what books I would put on the syllabus. I ended up discovering all these writers and books that I hadn't necessarily known before. So um, yeah, I really loved putting the syllabus together. That was really fun. I don't always, um, I'm not a voracious reader. I can't take so much in. I love reading, but I, I'm not somebody that's like gluttonous for literature. I like to just read a little, I read and then some time goes by when I can't read a book. I just like live with that book that I just last read. But when I was putting the syllabus together, I was really going through books and it was fun. You know, again, like I say, it was like being a student. My dog's just snoring. He's heard this all before. <laughs> So is that uh, something younger authors are expected to do, to write about sex today, to, to know how to write well about sex? Probably, yeah. I mean, you know, I mean, what's interesting about teaching this course, I, I've, I've done it chronologically. So we start in the 30s, but I could have started earlier. But yeah, there aren't that many people writing about sex um, at a time, at that time. Um, you know, Tropic of Cancer was censored, you know. Um, there now everybody writes about sex um but still not not most people don't do it so well it still is as as difficult a skill as it always was i think so so what makes a good sex scene for you um that it's about more than just the sex um that it's about the characters that it's about their relationship, that it's unembarrassed, um, that the writer's not holding back out of prudery, um, but also not overindulging for the sake of being writing a sex scene. It's, yeah. Garth Greenwell, Garth Greenwell he's an American writer Uh, he writes about um, gay men and his he writes about sex so incredibly well and you just feel like the characters express their everything about their psychology in in the sex scenes that he writes um, whereas a lot of people that write about sex are just writing about bodies you know he's writing about everything so do you think if you're really interested in your characters and try to try to bring across more than just sex can can you write about any sex even sex that you haven't experienced yourself yeah i mean i i hope so <laughs> i mean i guess like it's like anything like you have to be able to write about things that haven't just happened to you or else you're not gonna what do you you know yeah you just i mean it's imagination again right but i think that most of what you write of what one What one writes about is not what they've experienced per se, but the things that they've experienced, you kind of recombine them and you use the imagination. So there's always knowledge 
there. But Gail Jones, who we just studied, her book Corregidora, she writes about sex in a very dark way. Um, and in a way that you think that she is these characters, she's so knowledgeable about what they're going through emotionally. And, and she, I think she was actually very naive when she wrote those books. She was not an experienced person um, in all those ways that the books suggest. Yeah. There was a big piece in The Observer this weekend called How Women Conquered the World of Fiction. And uh, there was a part that reads, the novelist Luke Brown argued that only women have the freedom to present sex sexual relationships in ways that are real and complex. Writing in the Times Literary Supplement, he said that heterosexual male desire had been linked so closely to abuses of power that no sensible man is impolitic enough to write honestly about the more unpalatable aspects of their experiences of love with women. So I read this a couple of times and I was think, thinking he can't be serious. Like, do you think male authors should shy away from writing sex scenes now because of Me Too? I mean, I don't think they should, but I think probably many do. There's a right, I, you sent me that article um, and I read it this morning. And I when I read it, I thought about a writer named Sean Thor Conroe, who has his first book coming out next spring, but he's published short stories online. He's an American writer. His book is called Fuck Boy, but F-U-C-C-B-O-I. Mm -hmm. And it's, I read it and I was blown away by it. It's, and what he is not afraid of is to think about masculinity. It seemed really brave to me. And I thought this book really stands out for me because I do think that a lot of literature that I've read by you know, straight American young men is afraid to really look at what masculinity is and what masculinity is for them and in relationship to sex and women and culture. So I do think it takes a certain amount of courage to write to write about that stuff, especially right now. I mean, I've, I have male colleagues who didn't want to review motherhood because they were afraid they were stepping out of their lane mm -hmm. as men to review. And so I think people are nervous um, about being wrong and you have to be wrong. I mean, you have to risk being wrong, right? I, I think that, so if you're, so that article was sort of suggesting that women have this permit, feel this permission to write in a way that they haven't before and that the culture is welcoming it and that the men feel inhibited and the culture isn't welcoming it. I don't know. I think that, I just don't know. I mean, more women read fiction than men. So if that's the case, then it sort of makes sense that these women are, everyone's so excited about them and, and the, the readers are taking them up because a lot of times you read because you want to see a similar experience that you've had reflected back to you. Maybe if 75% of the readers of novels were men, there would be more exciting writing by young men. But maybe there is more exciting writing by young men. Like I just haven't come across as much of it because it's not being. Uh, have you noticed differences uh, in, in your book reviews, whether they were written by, by men or women? Well, with motherhood, I felt like I got much more unfair criticism from women mm -hmm. than men. I felt like the men were able to sort of see it as a novel much more, whereas a lot of the female critics, especially in the US, um, reacted very personally to the book and started talking about their own authority as mothers as like a prelude to criticizing the book it was there was a lot of very defensive um criticism um and a lot of misunderstanding i think about the book because of this proposition i think that maybe we should, one shouldn't have children you know and so a lot of the people that wrote reviews would say I went through labor and I'm a mother and and then would hate the book. 
so there was like some kind of intellectual dishonesty going on, but I think it was like below even the level of their consciousness because I mean, these are intellectuals. They're not going to want to, they're not going to want to see that they actually feel bad reading this book about a woman taking 300 pages to make a choice and choosing against it if perhaps they made a different choice or didn't really make a choice at all, just fell into a life that they may have com complicated feelings about. It's interesting because uh, uh, the, the, the women I know, the woman I know who I said I wrote this, one of the, one of the audiences in my book, Sarah Manguso, who is very happy to be a mother, but who's also, you know, not a sentimentalizing kind of person and is able to see the good and bad in her life. I felt like she was, she loved the book in the end, you know? I mean, she really loved the book. Um, I don't know, I, I feel like the book, I don't know, I thought it was kind of unfair the treatment it got, but, but, ne but almost never by male critics. But there were fewer of them because the newspapers are not gonna sign a book called Motherhood to Men. Do you still read all the book reviews? Mm -hmm. yeah, because I see it as a conversation, like, you know, a book is, a, is, so if I'm saying something with this book, or I'm having a character say something with this book, I want to see what the, what the response is. I can't understand putting something out and not reading the responses. Like, it's just, I don't know. I don't get it. Yeah. We have one question from the audience about motherhood. She, she wanted to know, What upset you so much about your friend's article? Well, she was basically saying that to be a mother is more, and essentially more grown up than never to have children. And I, I just thought that, Yes, there's a difference in experience. And of course, there's things you experience if you're a mother that you don't experience if you're not a mother. But then the person who chooses never to have children also has experiences that the woman who, or man who has children, I mean, it's a different life, different experiences, different knowledges, different wisdoms. And she was basically just saying, because she had left that life behind of not being a mother, that that life didn't have as much value as this new life that she was living as a mother. Um, and she said, you know, if you don't have children, if you have children, you're broken. You know, this is all very romantic. You're broken, your rent is sunder. You have to build yourself up from scratch. And she said at the end, her, I want to read books by people who have been broken and, and rent asunder, sunder. As though if you don't have children, you don't continue to live a human life in which things happen that are challenging and profound, you know, and, so, and you know, she's just saying, well, you, I, I mean, I, there's so many things about that piece. Like, so you're saying you don't want to read a book by somebody who can't have children, or you don't want to read a book by somebody who, I don't know, it was just very prejudiced, I guess. Mm -hmm. I don't like this cat making of two categories, women who are mothers and women who are not mothers, you know, Life is so much more complicated than to be able to say who's had more experience of life. Were there other things that uh, um, make make you come up with the idea for motherhood? What were the many things? What were the things that made me come up with the idea? Yeah. Well, it wasn't really an idea. It was more just a feeling like I'm I'm in this moment in my life in my 30s where it's all I can think about is whether or not to have children and I don't think it's and I don't want to think about it and I just kept thinking like I need to think about more important things I need to think about grander things more intellectual things things befitting me my mind you know And I was so frustrated that that's what I was drawn to think about. 
And then I realized, well, instead of trying to push it away, what happens if you actually accept it and make it the center of your thinking? And once I did that, I realized, actually, this is not a petty question. This is like one of the most profound questions a human can deal with. And it's only the culture that we live in that makes us think that it's a lifestyle choice or anything below the, the grandest questions that humans ask, you know, philosophical questions, should you make a life? And also, you know, once you choose, I kind of also kind of believe it doesn't really matter what you write about. You just have to choose a topic because any topic can hold everything. So the book is really not just about, of course, choosing whether or not to have a children. It's about grappling with what it means to be a body, what it means to live through time, what it means to make any choice at all, what it means to have to live one life and not be able to live the other life, what it means to be a daughter, you know, or to have like a history, you know, in the book, um, I write about the effects of this character, which are the same as the effects of me of the Holocaust. My grandmother was in Auschwitz and came out and, you know, there's this legacy of sort of, yeah, how do you contend with that as, 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 as a grandchild, as a child is the only way to, you know, what do you do with that story? What do you do with that pain? So it just becomes about so much. You just choose a topic and then it becomes about everything that you're thinking about. What was your question when you wrote, how should a person be? How should a person be? <laughs> <laughs> so how, how, how does it uh, relate to, to motherhood? How would you describe your development from the one book to the other? Um, I mean, when I was writing How Should a Person Be, I was really finding this new form for myself. The previous book I'd written was um, much more separate from my life. Uh, it was a male character who lived in Boston in, at the end of the 1800s. I was not used to making, when I started writing How Should a Person Be, I had never tried to write in this way where I was drawing from what was around me drawing from conversations, drawing from people living. I wanted to sort of be accountable to the present and to my present life. And so writing How Should a Person Be was a way of square, centering myself more intensely in my present reality. Um, and then when I started to write Motherhood, I had already done that with one book. So I didn't have to invent a form from scratch. I was able to sort of pick up and adapt that form to my new problem. Um, my idea would be that you read from uh, How Should a Person Be? And the audience can take the time to think about questions for you. Okay. So if you have any questions, um, think about them now and you can put them in the chat and we'll discuss them here. Okay, so this is How Should a Person Be? The American Hardcover. Uh, okay. I'm reading the prologue. How should a person be? For years and years, I asked it of everyone I met. I was always watching to see what they were going to do in any situation so I could do it too. I was always listening to their answers. So if I liked them, I could make them my answers too. I noticed the way people dressed, the way they treated their lovers. In everyone, there was something to envy. You can admire anyone for being themselves. It's hard not to when everyone's so good at it. But when you think of them all together like that, how can you choose? How can you say, I'd rather be responsible like Misha than irresponsible like Margot? Responsibility looks so good on Misha and irresponsibility looks so good on Margot. How could I know which would look best on me? I admired all the great personalities down through time like Andy Warhol and Oscar Wilde. They seem to be so perfectly themselves in every way. I didn't think those are great souls, but I did think those are some great personalities for our age. Charles Darwin, Albert Einstein, they did things, but they were things. I know that personality is just an invention of the news media. I know that character exists from the outside alone. I know that inside the body, there's just temperature. So how do you build your soul? At a certain point, I know you have to forget about your soul and just do the work you're required to do. To go on and on about your soul is to miss the whole point of life. I could say that with more certainty if I knew the whole point of life. I worry too much about Oscar Wilde and Andy Warhol is just a lot of vanity. How should a person be? I sometimes wonder about it and I can't help answering like this. 
a celebrity. But for all that I love celebrities, I would never move somewhere that celebrities actually exist. My hope is to live a simple life in a simple place where there's only one example of everything. By a simple life, I mean a life of undying fame that I don't have to participate in. I don't want anything to change except to be as famous as one can be, but without that changing anything. Everyone would know in their hearts that I am the most famous person alive, but not talk about it too much. And for no one to be too interested in taking my picture, for they'd all carry around in their heads an image of me that was unchanging, startling, and magnetic. No one has to know what I think, for I don't really think anything at all. And no one has to know the details of my life, for there are no good details to know. It is the quality of fame one is after here, without any of its qualities. In an hour, Margo's gonna come over and we're gonna have our usual conversation. Before I was 25, I never had any friends, but the friends I have now interest me nonstop. Margo compliments me in interesting ways. She paints my picture and I record what she's saying. We do whatever we can to make the other one feel famous. In this way, I should be satisfied with being famous to three or four of my friends. And yet it's an illusion. They like me for who I am. And I would rather be liked for who I appear to be and for who I appear to be to be who I am. We are all specks of dirt all on this earth at the same time. I look at all the people who are alive today and think, these are my contemporaries. These are my fucking contemporaries. We live in an age of some really great blowjob artists. Every era has its art form. The 19th century I know is tops for the novel. I just do what I can not to gag too much. I know boyfriends get really excited when they can touch the soft flesh at the back of your throat. At these times, I just try to breathe through my nose and not throw up on their cock. I did vomit a little the other day, but I kept right on sucking. Soon the vomit was gone and then my boyfriend pulled me up to kiss me. Aside from blowjobs though, I'm through with being the perfect girlfriend, just through with it. Then if he's sore with me, let him dump my ass. That will just give me more time to be a genius. One good thing about being a woman is we haven't too many examples yet of what a genius looks like. It could be me. There's no ideal model for how my mind should be. For the men, it's pretty clear. That's the reason you see them trying to talk themselves up all the time. I laugh when they won't say what they mean so the academies will study them forever. I'm thinking of you, Mark Z, and you, Christian B. You just keep peddling your phony baloney genius crap while I'm up giving blowjobs in heaven. My ancestors took what they had, which was nothing, and left their routines as slaves in Egypt to follow Moses into the desert in search of the promised land. For 40 years, they wandered through sand. At nights, they rested where they could against the dunes that had built up, been built up by the winds. Waking the next morning, they took the flour from their sacks and moistened it with their spit and beat together a smooth dough, then set off, stooped across the sand, the dough spread across their backs. It mingled with the salt of their sweat and hardened in the sun, and this is what they had for lunch. Some people spread the dough flat, and that dough became matzah. Others rolled tubes and fastened the ends, and those people ate bagels. For so many years, I have written soul like this, S-O-U-L-D, sold, and make no other consistent typo. A girl I met in France once said, cheer up, maybe it doesn't actually mean that you sold your soul. I was staring unhappily into my beer, but rather that you never had a soul to sell. We were having Indian food. The man next to us was an Englishman and he brightened up. He said, it's so nice to hear English being spoken here. I haven't heard any English in weeks. We tried not to smile. For smile only, we tried not to smile, for smiling only encourages men to bore you and waste your time. I thought about what that girl had said for a week. I was determined to start the task I had long been putting off, having for too long imagined it would take care of itself in the course of things without my paying attention to it, all the while knowing in my heart that I was avoiding it, trying to patch myself together with my admiration for the traits I saw so clearly in everyone else. I said to myself sternly, it's time to stop asking questions of other people. It is time to just go into a cocoon and spin your soul. When I got back to the city, I neglected this plan in favor of hanging out with my friends every night of the week, just as I had been doing before I'd left for the continent. The girl who had given me her condolences was in her mid thirties, an American in Paris named Jen. She was a friend of a friend and had in a friendly way, accepted my request to be put up for the nights I would be there. Her job was doing focus groups for large corporations, including the United States Army, which she wanted help with its recruitment advertising. She had some ethical qualms about this, but was more concerned with her boyfriend, who had suddenly started ignoring her. This was the central preoccupation of her life when I arrived, because it was the more emotional. 
There are certain people who do not feel like they were raised by wolves and they are the ones who make the world tick. They are the ones who keep everything functioning so the rest of us can worry about what sort of person we should be. I've read all the books and I know what they say. You, but better in every way. And yet there's so many ways of being better and these ways can contradict each other. Yesterday, Margot told me a story that her mother often tells about when she was a baby. It took Margot a long time to talk and everyone thought she was a little dumb. Margot's mother had a friend who was a bit messed up and really into self-help books and all sorts of self-improvement tapes. One day, she'd been telling Margot's mother about a technique in which whatever problem you came across in your life, you were just supposed to throw up your hands and say, who cares? That night, as Margot's parents and her slightly older sister were sitting around the dinner table and Margot was in her high chair, her sister spilled her milk and the glass broke all across the table. Her mother started yelling and her sister started crying. Then, from over in the high chair, they heard little Margot going, who cares? I'm sorry, but I'm really glad she's my best friend. If I had known when I was a baby that in America there was a baby who was throwing up her hands and saying first words out of her mouth, who cares? And that one day she'd be my best friend, I would have relaxed for the next 23 years, not a single care in the world. Thank you. Um, I reread um, How Should a Person Be last week and um, it was interesting for me to, because to me, I think the most spoke how you wrote about friendship because I, I saw a lot of similarities um, with friendships I had to, to women over the years and how how they even ended. So um, I found that really interesting. And that I was wondering if it's if it might be even harder to write about friendship than about sex. Yeah, well, this was hard because, um, because, you know, writing about a real person, about a friendship, and then publishing it changes the friendship and affects the person that's being written about. And it wasn't um, a particularly easy thing for Margot um, af after the book was published. I mean, she read like a dozen versions of the book, but when it actually comes into the world, you know, it, it affects things. Um, we're still best friends, but it, it's been, I'll never do this again. I'll just say, I'll never do this again. It has, it wasn't super easy. Um, there were times when it was just kind of too overwhelming for both of us and for her in particular. But writing about sex, yeah, like because you're writing in many cases, or at least at this point in my life, uh, I was writing about experiences with people that I didn't care about that much, you know, and writing about a friendship. I mean, for most women or many women, their friendships are as important to them as their romantic relationships. They're that deep, you know. And you, and in many cases, friendships last longer than romantic relationships, especially in your 20s. So yeah, there's a real risk to writing about them in a way that there's not the same risk to writing about sex, depending on. We have what, one question from the audience about the book, uh, who wants to know what is the meaning of the tape recorder for you? A, the meaning of the tape recorder is a tape recorder. <laughs> um, you know, I mean, I was carrying a tape recorder around at the time that I was writing this book and tape recording our conversations. I wanted to tape record our real conversations and, and transcribe them and read them so I could know what the contemporary voice sounded like. Um, it was a way of learning. What do we really say? I wanted this book to sound, I wanted the book to sound spoken more than written. And I wanted to, it to be a, more of a spoken language. So it was a way of studying for me and research. Um, another one wants to know, what are you currently reading? Um, mostly books for this class. I mean, every, you know, um, well, right now I'm reading The Demon by Hubert Selby Jr. because that's the book that we're going to be studying next week. I'm just rereading all the books, you know, because for me, when I read a book, it's very easy to sort of like then absorb it and sort of forget it. Like it just becomes part of the ecosystem inside me. So I need to read it again in order to like have it be differentiated, like something separate from me and its own thing rather than like just part of the, you know, the mess of stuff in my brain. So I'm just reading the books for the class. 
Yeah, I think um, the description of the class is on the website of University Leipzig and all the books are listed there, yeah. right? When yeah, I think so. I hope so. Somebody wants to know. Um, there's a question of someone who wants to know about being a Picardo professor. For instance, what do you think you might learn from this experience? Oh, I'm already learning a lot. I mean, teaching is, um, you know, a way of learning for sure. And um, I mean, I and I'm 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 thinking about literature in a different way. You know, when you teach it, you have to analyze it and under try to understand why things work. So, I my ideal would be to come out of it and sort of write differently as a result of this, as a result of. Of, of reading texts in this way and getting the responses of the students. I mean, you know, it's interesting. I mean, when you were asking me about the reviews of motherhood, I, I, I couldn't help but express my own hurt and sort of dismay at some of the critics' um, response to the book. But, you know, when I sent out the Henry Miller book, which was the first book that we read, Tropic of Cancer, in my class, and then everyone sent me their reading responses, and, you know, some people love it and pe some people don't like it, and the reasons people have for not liking it are fine, legitimate pe reason people have for liking it. And I just, it just reminded me like, that is what art is, you know, it's not a unanimous, it doesn't create a, uni a unanimous response, it creates a chorus, you know, and something about that um, was good for me to see with a book that I was taking personally, I was taking this Henry Miller book personally, because I had given it to 20 students. So, although, of course, I know that every book that goes out into the world has a varied response. I felt more responsibility that, oh, I've given this book to people and they don't like it. And it was a feeling akin to when people don't like my book. But in the case of Henry Miller, I was able to have enough distance to be like, well, of course, some people don't like it. It's a crazy book. It's okay. It doesn't have to be for everyone. So I feel like it's even like made me think about criticism in a different way to see, to get all these responses every week. Like, it's okay, it's nothing to be afraid of, you know? It's nothing to be afraid of that half the people are gonna hate it. And, and I would say, it, in some sense, misunderstand the intent of the author, but even that's okay. We don't all understand each other. There's a question, what are the things you are most proud of in each of your books? I mean, I, I always feel like I wrote the book I wanted to write. You know, I, I, I always feel like that's, I don't see that I compromised. Um, I was able to write the book that, yeah, that I wanted to write. And um, there's Evelyn, no, Somerset Mom quote, which is we write not as we want, but as we can. And I think that's really true. It's, you know, the feeling of accomplishment is not that, oh, I've written the book that I wanted to write. It's like, I really wrote the book I could write, you know, um, and I didn't write somebody else's book. I didn't write a book I'd read. I, I wrote the book that was, so I think that's, that's always a good feeling because otherwise I think you look at it and you feel alienated from it. And I just don't feel alienated from them. So was, did you work on a project that that you didn't finish, that didn't work out? Yeah, I mean, there's there's things that I've written that I just sort of stop or don't finish. Not every idea is worth spending seven years on. <laughs> Not every question is takes seven years to answer. What was a book that really interested and fascinated you as a child? There was a book called That Scatterbrain Bookie, the, that's her name, Bookie, Buki, B-O-O-K-Y, and it took place in Toronto during the Great Depression. And it was like a girl who was like, I don't know, eight or nine or 10 years old, whatever age I was when I read it. And I was just completely fascinated with it. I I loved that book. I, I guess because it was set in Toronto in part. And I, and I felt like the girl was like me. It was like this skinny girl with blonde hair, like, and she was kind of like a, yeah, chat, like a chatterbox and a scatterbrain. Like I just felt, I guess it was the first time I read a book where I really felt like that's me. Um, and I loved it. I, I loved that book. Do you have a favorite tarot card? I like the fool. <laughs> 
I like the fool because it's, we sort of need to be a fool, you know, in order to do anything um, truly worthwhile. And so I, I like that walking off the mountain with without looking down. You know, I mean, it's always you whenever you're writing a book, you have no idea what you're doing. You maybe know that day, but you don't really know, you know, and you don't know. Um, it's such a balance between knowing what you're doing and having no idea what you're doing at all. And I think that's sort of the fool. Like he knows he's walking off the mountain. But he doesn't know he's walking off the mountain, you know. Um, somebody wants to know if there'll be a chance to take a writing class with you without being a student sometime soon. Um, yeah, I think I might do another workshop in the spring through my speakers bureau. So, um, so I'll probably get back on Twitter to promote it. I'm not on it right now, but like put a note in your calendar to follow me on Twitter in August or something and I'll get back on and I'll promote the class from there. Mm -hmm. Or maybe I'll put it on my website or something. I'll probably do something on, in the fall. Mm -hmm. I did something in the spring and it worked out well. Do you have a writing routine? No, I just feel like I'm writing all the time and like none of the time. It's always surprising to me that books actually get written because I don't have a routine, but I, you know, you don't really need a routine if it's something that you love. And if you don't, and you, if it's something you love, you just do it whenever you can. And I kind of feel like I just do it whenever I, I just, it doesn't feel like work. I mean, it is work. It feels like work in the sense that it's challenging, but it doesn't feel like work in the sense that I need to force myself to do it. I like to do it. Um, so no, I don't really have a routine. I've never had a routine. I can go for weeks without writing or months without writing and it's fine. You know. Are you going to work on anything today? Uh, I'm gonna try to finish the copy edit for my book, I think. Yeah, I'd like to get that done because it's it's depressing me. I I feel very disconnected from the book right now and I don't really like it. And I, I, I'm not enjoying reading it over at this point. So I think I just want to sort of do it fast and then I'll get the laid out pages. And once you see the pages in layout in the font that it's gonna be, then it becomes new to you again. I just can't, I just can't look at it on the computer anymore. Yeah. Do you know what the cover is going to look like yet? We have some covers, like we're moving towards it, but we don't have the final one yet. It's a big controversy between me and a, I, there was an image that I really liked and everyone said it, it looked like a pimento olive and uh, it's an Ellsworth Kelly painting. And as soon as they said that, I just couldn't see, I could, I could never unsee it. Um, so that might not be the image that we go with, but we'll see. I hope it's, you know, you, covers, you just want it to feel like your book. And how does, an, how does a cover feel like a book? That's a very big, big thing to want. I, this, I don't know. I don't know, like, does this cover like feel like my book? Like, no, like my book feels like my book. A cover is some completely other thing. Mm -hmm. So, but I think we'll get there. I think this time there'll be the cover that really feels like my book. <laughs> So yeah, I think um, that's it for tonight because we're already a bit, a bit behind schedule. Thank you so much for taking the time, Sheila. It was really interesting, really lovely. Uh, I saw in the chat that um, some people are really excited about your new book and want to know more about it. I think it comes out in February, right? Mm -hmm. That was a question. So um, yeah, I'm excited too. And um, maybe we'll do another talk about that book when it comes out when you do any promo at all. <laughs> yeah, I'd like to come to Leipzig. I mean, when this yeah. book is published and I do want to come to, I do want to come back to Berlin. I love Berlin and I, I'd like to visit Leipzig and like hopefully like meet my students in real life. Like we can all go to a bar or something like that and like, or to a park or whatever. <laughs> yeah, that would be great if that, that would be possible to meet them yeah. in person. And how long does the, does the class go till summer? Till the middle of July, I think something like that, yeah. End of July. Yeah, yeah that would be great. So do you want to add anything that you, you couldn't share? No, just thank you for your questions. I really in, enjoyed them a lot. Appreciate it. So yeah, thank you. So we'd like to thank Holzbrink Berlin, Picador Publishing, the German Academic Exchange Service, and the University of Leipzig 
for making this event happen tonight, as well as our network partner, Rowold, who's the publisher of Sheila's books here in Germany. If you want to know more about the Picador guest professorship, you can visit the, the website picadorprof.de and their social media accounts. They will share um, information about tonight. I think there will be a recording of the talk. If you know people who couldn't watch it and want to watch it later, I think that will, will be possible. So we'll share that on social media again. Yeah. So thank you, Sheila. Thank you. And enjoy your day. Enjoy the rest of the lockdown. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> Take care. Good night, everyone. Good night.